So something that's really important to understand when you're building out web applications is race conditions and how to set up your code in such a way to prevent these race conditions from happening. This is more common when you have an application where multiple users can modify the same items in a database. And you kind of have to make sure that your code is written properly so that you don't have people kind of completely overriding the changes of others. So let's do a quick little scenario here with a diagram. I have two users, user A and user B, and we have a database. And let's say that they're trying to access an API. They both click a button around the same time, and that hits an API endpoint. Let's talk about the race condition scenario. So the first person is going to hit an endpoint to basically increment a counter in a row on a table, right? And so this logic is going to go ahead and fetch the current count from the table. And then at the same time, the other user is also going to select the current count from the database. So remember, both of these API endpoints are running basically concurrently. One is probably a little bit faster than the other. So now somewhere in your code, you have to basically take that record you got back from the database, you add one to it, and the other user is doing the same thing, his code's doing the same thing. And then finally, you write back that count of one because it's zero plus one back to this database. But unfortunately, the other user also writes the exact same thing. They are writing zero plus one back to the database. Now this is a race condition that can happen if you're not careful with how you write your code. And ultimately this count is going to be one in this database, but we want it to be two. So this is obviously the most trivial example, but it really highlights the issue of you can have multiple users all trying to modify the same record and one user's request may overwrite another user's request and cause a lot of data inconsistencies and problems. All right, so let's go over to code because I know you guys love seeing code. So let's go and look at this endpoint called count. And when you do a post request to this endpoint, what it's doing is it's doing that same logic. It tries to get a record from the database and then it tries to do that record plus one and then it rewrites it to the database using a db.update and that's it. So let me go ahead and make sure my local Postgres database is running and I have and I have Drizzle Studio running. So let's go to the counts and notice here we have a count of zero. So I have a script that's going to hit this endpoint with about 100 concurrent requests and it's going to highlight this issue. So I have a script down here in bash um, and it's called test. So I'm going to make a new tab down here. I'm going to say dot slash test dot sh and let's run this. And what this does is it's just going to make 100 post requests to that slash count endpoint all as background processes so this is going to try to fire off as fast as possible and then when it's all done we're going to go back and look at the database refresh and notice that count is set to two so as we kind of diagrammed here you have a hundred requests but they all ultimately ended up overriding the previous writes and now your count is two so huge issue now this is more apparent on like systems that actually have a lot of users and a lot of traffic and concurrent writes but this is still an issue. You don't want that count to be off. You want it to be 100. So let's kind of go and look at a fix. So I have a count fixed one endpoint. Now, obviously, the easiest solution to do this is probably just use an update clause in your database, right? You don't need to select the data first just to get the count. If it's something trivial like this, you could just go ahead and increment that count by one directly in your SQL statement. And this is how I'd recommend doing it. But this, but this really only works for like trivial tasks. It doesn't work for more complicated things. Let's just go ahead and run the second test. So test fix one. And now if I were to go back and let's just clear this count out so that we can start at a fresh state, I'm going to run this test. And obviously this is going to make our count equal to hundred. That's the expected output. So that is one solution for that race condition is just make sure your queries are written properly so that every time you're doing writes, you're going to leverage the power of Postgres, which is going to do kind of transactions under the hood and do locks on the rows so that every time it does a write, it's going to be the latest, greatest um, value that it's updating. All right, so let's move on to another fix. So fix two. Now this is going to leverage the power of a transaction, but more specifically, we're doing a for update suffix at the end of the SQL statement. So if you're using Postgres, you can actually add something called for update at the very end of your SQL statement. And what this is kind of doing is that the first transaction is going to put like a lock on this row so that if other people come along and try to also read that same row, they are going to, you know, be delayed. They're going to wait until that first request is completely done with this entire transaction. Now, now I will say, be sure to correct me in the comments if I say anything incorrect. Um, I'm not like a super expert at this stuff. I've been trying to read through some blog posts, which I'll put the links in the descriptions below. I highly recommend reading them if you wanna become a better engineer. 
Uh, they're written by people probably a lot smarter than me. I've been reading through this one as well about anti-patterns for SQL and Postgres. And then also, if you go to the Postgres docs, if you can stomach it and read through all this crazy text and engineering jargon, um, this can really help you understand how transactions work as well. But let me just kind of demo this real quick and I'll kind of talk about some downsides to this approach. So I'm gonna reset that count back to zero. I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna say test two. So now when I run this, this is going to do the exact same thing as before. The count will go up to 100, so it's all working fine. But there are some limitations to this. This approach will reduce the performance because it is creating some type of lock under the hood, right? So you can't just have a bunch of queries concurrently execute. You know, the one has to kind of wait for the other lock to, to be relinquished before you can kind of go through. This will cause lower performance because there's going to be more contention on the database and like on that record itself. So let's move on to fix number three. So when you're using Postgres and SQL, typically you have the ability to set isolation levels on your transaction. So in this case, I'm sending to serializable. And this is basically going to do the blocking, like I said before. But instead of it just kind of waiting for the lock to be relinquished, and then it'll go ahead and just do its logic, this will actually throw an error if someone currently has a lock on this record and you try to write to it. Okay, so let's just go ahead and run fix test three, and I wanna show you what happens. So when I run this and I go back to the counts, notice that the count is only incremented by 10. So there's, there's a race condition going on here, and the reason is because we're getting a ton of errors. We have all of these could not serialize access due to concurrent value issues or concurrent update issues. And again, that's because there is a second transaction trying to update on a previous transaction that's currently in the process of like running. Now this will give you the strongest consistency in your database and it kind of gives you a way to react as a developer if you want to kind of catch that error and do something specific. Maybe you want to send back an error to the user saying, hey, you know, someone is already modifying this document, try again later. But again, this is going to have more performance issues because of all the locking that's going on. All right, let's move on to the last one. This is another strategy you can potentially do, and this is called an optimistic update. So the idea is on your record itself, you'll have like a, a version or maybe you'll have like a, a last updated timestamp. So the key to the optimistic update is you have a where clause here and you basically say, I only want to run this update if the current version that's in the database matches the version that I found on line seven when I did the query. If it doesn't match, then you know that someone else already updated that record and you need to gracefully handle that error. Now, again, with this approach and the last approach, errors are going to be thrown. So it's kind of up to you to figure out the best scenarios to kind of clean this all up. Although this is a transaction, so stuff will be rolled back, you still want to either tell the user that something went wrong and they can retry, or you need to add some type of nice user experience where it just retries for them automatically. And if for some reason they just cannot get this transaction through, maybe let them know. So the reason this approach is good is because it's not going to really add locks to records and rows. So it's going to allow more concurrent data reads and writes, but it just requires more work to basically make sure that you are handling these failover scenarios gracefully. Now, I do want to end this video saying I'm not an expert at this stuff. I'm not like a database administrator or an expert. Um, I have been working the past five years using DynamoDB, which is a basically like a key value store. And a lot of this stuff is abstracted away. You don't have to worry about it. Dynamo does have the ability to do strong, consistent writes and reads from the DynamoDB table. So the concepts still kind of apply. I just haven't really been immersed as much in SQL and like, you know, professional SQL in my day-to-day -day work. Uh, again, like I said, I use DynamoDB. So if there's anything that you found really useful, give me a thumbs up. It really helps my channel grow. And leave a comment below if there's anything I said wrong about these approaches or if you wanted, maybe I didn't elaborate enough on something feel free to leave a comment so other people can learn from my misteachings. Uh, like always, I have a Discord channel. You guys are welcome to join. The link is in the description if you want to find a place to kind of hang out and ask questions to some other developers. All right, have a good day and happy coding.